Hello, or I should say good morning, Los Angeles. Hello, lovers of the black and gold. Hello, fans of Major League Soccer. And of course, hello and good morning and happy daylight savings time because it's a heck of a lot earlier than it should be uh, to the millions. And millions. Of Defenders of the Bank listeners. This is episode 291 and season seven of Defenders of the Bank. And uh, woof, we are going to recap a draw. A hard-fought draw, but a draw. Win, lose, or draw. That's right. But first and foremost, introductions are in order. If you don't know who we are, welcome. And if you're a longtime listener, welcome back. Mwah. We love you. We absolutely do. My name is Christian Philem the platinum-haired flamingo. And joining me, the Lord of Lawndale, the King of Knits, the Tyrant of Threads, Senor J.R. Liebert, also known by his other alias, the scarf what is good defenders nation nothing like a nil nil draw to get your blood pumping but you know what this nil nil draw was not like other zero zero scoreless games this was actually a well-played game for the most part yes i know defenders nation might be a little frustrated at coach steve Chirundolo only making one substitution but i'll counter with peter vermese didn't make any so there's that. I don't know. You play 90 minutes, just one guy coming off the fourth 0-0 home draw in club history. And Philly, uh, it was a bummer because, look, normally we are at every single match. But you and I were calling a game on ESPN+, Plus, the women of UC Riverside and their victory uh, over UC Santa Barbara. So both of us, for the first time in a long time, had to miss a match. Yeah, uh, and I honestly, when ESPN knocks on your door, you 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 answer it. These are opportunities that you know are starting to become rather plentiful. So want to continue to take advantage of these scenarios. And the unfortunate thing is, yes, it did mix in with an LAFC game. The tip off was originally scheduled for 6 p.m., which would have meant Scarf and I had a fighting chance of making it there by halftime. Problem is, they pushed it to seven, which gave us no hope at all to make it to BMO Stadium. And so that's why we ended up missing out on that. I don't think there are going to be many scheduling conflicts going forward. I mean, basketball is over. I, I don't, haven't seen my baseball schedule yet, but we had a good time calling the basketball game. And it wasn't <laughs> in that episode of Defenders of the Bank. We actually, we were professional on this endeavor, but it was a lot of fun. And it's always good doing stuff like this. Uh, not just because it's fun doing stuff like this, but when I get to do it with Scarf, uh, I just feel the chemistry is there. I ain't no science major, but I know chemistry when I see it. <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely had a good time. It is, however, good to be back talking about the black and gold. We have both rewatched the game. I know it was a nil-nil draw and we got in late, but you know what? Oh, boy, we dude. both wanted to keep everybody up to speed on what was going on. And look, for a 0-0 zero -zero draw, for any draw, this was actually a very well-played match. I know I've said this a few times, but... Pretty even on both sides. Some frustrating moments for the black and gold for sure. But first, let's get into the usual suspects at the start of any of our episodes. We want to remind everybody that the Mo Fascio Futsal Court fundraising effort is still underway. LAFC.com backslash Mo hyphen Fascio to donate and get this field, this futsal court built in Mo's honor. Let's make it happen. And as a quick reminder, if you are not already, please follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, uh, at Defenders of the Bank, and that's Bank with a C, and on X, Twitter, whatever Elon Musk is calling it, at Defend the Bank. So please give us a follow there. And it's time for this day in LAFC history. You are listening to this podcast, hopefully, on Sunday, March 10th. So let's talk about the March 10th of 2018, the first brace in club history recorded by Diego Rossi. Ben, that's funny. We'll get to you in a minute. A 5-1 <laughs> win at Real Salt Lake. 5-1 LAFC over Real Salt Lake. The first brace in club history by Diego Rossi. The first multi-assist game in club history by none other than Steven Betashore. Latif Blessing, Benny Failhaber, Carlos Vela rounding out the scoring, and it was the 100th MLS cap for Dayon 
Yakovich. The first ever game, by the way, in our road white jerseys. Uh, LAFC also launched their mobile app. Uh, and on uh, 2019, one year later, LAFC at home defeats the Portland Timbers. Carlos Vela with two assists in that game, uh, along with his goal, Mark Anthony K, Christian Ramirez, and Adama Diomande, an interesting name that might come up just a little bit in our banter, Philly, rounding out the scoring. Uh, and some news and notes. Look, let's get it over with right off the top. Philly, the, the biggest news of the season so far for LAFC is locking up number 99. I'm just trying really hard not to laugh. So for those of you wondering what's going on, our good buddy Ben posts in the chat, is uh, is this the Joker versus Riddler pod? And the reason why that's being done is because Scarf's wearing a green Defender shirt that might be marketed at some point. I don't know. And I've got the um, the uh, the purple the, the Joker colored goalkeeper kit on. So like that, we we had a really good cackle on that. So thank you, Ben, for. Uh, thankfully, I didn't have any coffee in my mouth to spit out, but thank you for making me laugh. Yes, the big news, the absolute biggest news, the news we are waiting for and the news that we believe is going to open the floodgates for more things to come is the signing slash extension of Denny Bowanga. There was that talk during the offseason about him being linked to a potential move back to Europe, primarily in France, although there were a couple of Italian teams that were sniffing around too. Uh, but LAFC... Sign him to an extension, guaranteed it through 2027 with a team option for 2028. And it is a well-deserved extension. The man was the golden boot leader. It was one of the biggest goal scorers uh, from any club globally. Scored more goals than virtually 99% of other strikers on the planet. So why not give him a little more money and secure him for a longer period of time? So we will have his services for a few more years again contracted through 2027 with a team option for 2028. And now that they have him on the books, because we know how crazy Major League Soccer is with their Monopoly money, your Tam Gam, thank you, ma'am, that should open the door for other people within our sites. Uh, obviously, Carlos Vela being one of those names potentially. And then Scarf said something uh, about banter regarding a certain Adama Diamande. So since you brought that up, why don't you continue with that? Part. All right, look, here's the deal. Uh, the No Context LAFC, by the way, which is a great follow on Twitter if you don't follow at No Context LAFC, posted a, a short clip from what looked like the suite at a Lakers game. Uh, that uh, it, You definitely saw uh, Tech Boss in there along with LAFC Rich and Adama Diamande hanging out in the suite. Look, I, I brought it up several pods ago when Toronto let go of Adama Diamande. For not a lot of money, as a depth piece, I feel like, especially in our system, with our with the familiarity that he has with our system and with our culture at LAFC, I know, everybody, I know, it, it looks like Adama Diamande might be on his maybe last chance or, or last... Uh, Last time to be able to prove himself as a consistent striker still. But, man, imagine if we get Denny Bawanga, number 99. I don't even know what Adama Diamande would wear when he comes back. But it could be really cool to see Adama Diamande in black and gold. Look, we need depth, people. We need depth. And I'll talk about why with our with our next piece of news. But I know Philly's not a, not a big fan. I love Dio. Absolutely love Dio. He thrashed through opposing defenses like you wouldn't believe. Bull in a china shop. That 2018 season when the best, when half of our starters went to the World Cup, Dio came in and just started going gangbusters. But let's not kid ourselves. This is not, and it can't be, the same Dio that played in 44 games for us and scored 20 goals. 2021, he's in China, and he's gone through one, two, three, four. Five different clubs since 2021, playing yeah. a grand total of 28 games. 28 games since 2021 with five clubs. Most recently with Toronto FC, where, get this, five times. Five times he featured. Why? Dio is injury prone. He is 34. What more can you say about him? He had his time in the sun. I appreciated his uh, his efforts. Hull City Dio was okay. LAFC Dio was even better. But at this point, 
I get the depth pieces, but unless it's for way less money than what we're paying Hugo Lloris, I think that we should go outside and look towards different players as opposed to LAFC alumni. That's just my take. But if it's a hundred grand, well then sure. All right. I, I need somebody to explain something for me too. I'm on transfer market. I know transfer market is not the, the end all be all of statistical well, that's how Toronto price. signed the Italians. Right. But there's something I've never seen for a, for a non keeper before. It says that Adama Diamande is currently in what's called the MLS pool. It doesn't say without club. Normally it says without club, but it says here MLS pool. And and just so that we're clear, there are three players currently in that that nebulous MLS pool, according to Transfer Market. It's left back Alex Gershbach, formerly of Colorado Rapids. It's Chris Mavinga, who we are all very familiar with, both with his time at Toronto FC and Carson Galaxy. And it's Adama Diamande. Uh, look, Adama Diamande uh, on Valentine's Day turned 34 years old. Nobody is saying, Ben Skolnick needs to stop it. Nobody is saying that Adama Diamande is our answer up top for a true number <laughs> nine or a striker or whatever it might be. But all, all I'm saying is then. <laughs> he doesn't need to be Adama Diamande for 90 minutes, but maybe he comes off the bench in the 80th and, and is bull in a china shop and tries to steal one again. We're not saying it's going to happen, but look, we, we could still dream the visions of Adama Diamande dancing in our head of what he did to the Carson Galaxy in our 5-3 win are still fresh. I'm just saying. Yeah, I just see a bull with an ACL tear. That's just what I, I, I didn't envision. And, you know, just when you think you know enough about Major League Soccer where you've weeded through all the chaos you start to understand how all the different allocation money works you start to understand the meaning of what a, a an mls pool is for goalkeeper and now all of a sudden you're throwing a pool for player at me as well i don't know this is the league that never ceases to amaze and that's one of the main reasons why i like it because it is chaos calamity and confusion and that's what makes it fun i mean and let's be let's be real i don't know that it's even a thing i just know that it's on transfer market uh, by the way, the last goalkeeper to be in the keeper pool, according to Wikipedia, is Kenneth Vermeer. So that tells you <laughs> quite a bit. That, that's what's... odd because I've got the Kenneth Vermeer style jersey on. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's it, I, I don't even know anymore. <clears throat> Look, the last little bit of LAFC news and notes. Thomas Musto of LAFC 2 was signed to a short-term contract before the match against Sporting Kansas City to give us some midfield depth for this match. It's the second time <laughs> that Musto has been called in <coughs> retired. Ben Skolnick in the chat today, everybody. You get him on the uh, pod. This is, this is pure comedy, y'all. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the second time that Thomas Musto has been called up from LAFC 2. So there's that. We just want to remind everybody that St. Patrick's Day – uh, one of the reasons why I'm wearing this shirt is going to be a busy day if you're fans of either LAFC 2 or Angel City FC. Angel City FC has their home match moved to St. Patrick's Day at 7 p.m. Uh, it'll be the inaugural match in the history of the club Bay FC, the new expansion club. That's March 17th at 7 p.m. And as a reminder, please make sure you are liking, following, and subscribing to all things at Angel City Chicks for your Angel City FC news. And LAFC 2 will also be playing their first match on St. Patrick's Day. Titan Stadium, Cal State Fullerton versus the Loons 2, Minnesota United 2, 1 p.m. St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and that's it for news and notes. Philly, Sporting Kansas City coming into the match, drawing their first two matches of the season. I'm ignoring Ben in the chat at this point. A 1-1 draw at the Houston Dynamo, a 1-1 draw home to the Philadelphia Union. Two very solid teams, Sporting Kansas City doing what they can, but still coming into the match 0-0-2 on the year. Hold on to your draws, folks, and I mean that in multiple ways, multiple ways. Sporting Kansas City is one of those teams that – usually gives opponents a, a tough time. Now, going through LAFC's past several matches, they've usually gotten the, the hot hand and got one over on Sporting Kansas City with an all-time record of 6-4-1. and one. 
but we know how things can go against Sporting Kansas City. Mentioned it on one more sleep. If you weren't there for that, shame on you. But I'll bring this fact up again just in case you weren't. Sporting Kansas City was the first team to beat LAFC at the bank in 2018 when we went almost an entire season without losing a single game in that beautiful facility. And since then, it's become a house of horrors for opposing teams. Uh, and that's the story with that. Ilya Sanchez was one of the goal scorers in that game, oddly enough. And Ilya Sanchez is now on the opposite side of the pitch. A man who's very well accustomed to the style of Peter Vermees. You know he's going to be militant with that 4-3-3. So having somebody like an Ilya Sanchez on your side, really, really good because he is meticulous. And with the attention to detail that Trundolo focuses on, it's also really good arrow to have in your quiver when you have somebody that's played in a system like Peter Vermeuses for a long time who understands everything going on. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And look, Sporting Kansas City, we're talking about Peter Vermees here, people. 502 matches at the helm of Sporting Kansas City, the only head man in Major League Soccer to make it to 500 matches with one club. An absolutely incredible job. And and Philly, we talked about this before. He was only... one foot, he was one foot out the door, and then he was a second foot up into the air with last season, what they start first 10 or 12 games without a win, and still made it to the MLS Cup playoffs last year. This also a very different sporting Kansas City team for two other main reasons. The old man in KC, Graham Zussi, 408 caps across all competitions for sporting Kansas City, retired. The red card Roger himself, Roger Espinoza, 396 caps with sporting Kansas City to go with 14 red cards. We're talking the two most capped players in club history and two of the top like 10 or 12 most capped players in major league soccer history, both retiring after 2023 Espinosa working with sporting Kansas city's youth clubs. I'm not sure what Graham Zussi is doing, but those two players uh, gone. I can tell you what he's doing. <laughs> those two players gone, leaving a leadership void that needs to be filled by the likes of guys like Alan Pulido and Johnny Russell. Uh, they were talking a little bit, too, about Josh Davis being a leader on the team. And I asked the question who Josh Davis was, but that's fine. And also out with injury on this one, Philly was a big one. Kyrie Shelton and Remy Voltaire. Remy Voltaire, uh, a goal scorer last match for them. So a striker out, Remy Voltaire out. And obviously, Zussi and Espinosa out, but it would still be that typical 4 3 3 that we would see from Peter Vermees. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, in, in case some of y'all are wondering, yes, Brian Schmetzer has coached the Seattle Sounders for well over 500 games, but that's incorporating his USL stats. So the Seattle Sounders, he was at the helm of them from 01 to 08. Uh, and he picked up 239 caps there. And then when the Seattle Sounders came through, July 26, 2016 is when he took place. So I knew he had over 500 caps coaching in the United States. And I thought that would put him up there with Peter Vermees. But fact check, that's the reason why. Yeah, I'm very careful with the way I work. Yes, you're a teacher, but <laughs> we both had funny faux pas on last night's ESPN broadcast. More <laughs> on that later. Now, you mentioned the people that we're not going to be featuring for Sporting Kansas City. You got to look at it for LAFC. Lorenzo De La Valle, obviously not coming into the match today. Still breaks my heart. The kid fought so hard to go from LAFC2 to the main club, and then he tears his ACL. Been paying attention to his story. So, young man, I know you watch this. Lorenzo, all the best. Wishing you a speedy recovery. But at your age, you're not even old enough to legally drink. You're going to be like Wolverine. Back out on the pitch in no time. Tomas Angel, that was a depth piece up top that did not feature. He was questionable. I believe it was a, a hamstring, um, or as they would refer to it last season, lower body extremity kind of a deal. I don't know if that's still going to be the case, but those are the only players that were out for LAFC. So a relatively healthy squad with a, uh, what we're seeing a consistent starting lineup. Yeah. Speaking of consistent starting lineup, let's get into the lineup for sporting Kansas city and a player who look, he was hurt for bits of last year, but from that goalkeeper pool to sporting Kansas city, uh, back, uh, I mean, he's been the the keeper in Sporting Kansas City for 
almost a decade now. He might not be the tallest, but he's one of the quickest goalkeepers that we have in Major League Soccer, Tim Melia. Uh, look, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna bury the lead here for a quick second. Man of the match, Tim mm -hmm. Melia. One. Absolutely did everything that he needed to do to keep sporting Kansas City into this match. Tim Melia, an incredible game for sporting Kansas City in this. And we'll talk about he made three or four absolutely massive doorstep saves on LAFC throughout the course of the 90, 95 minutes that were played. Uh, defenders Tim Liebold, Andreu Fontas, Danny Rosero, and Josh Davis in the midfield. Memo Rodriguez, Nemanja Radoja, and Eric Tommy, who was Philly's pick to click. My pick to click was Daniel Shallowy at forward. Alan Pulido making his 350th club start in his professional career. And Johnny Soccer, Johnny Russell, as good of a forward as we have in Major League Soccer. I'd mention anybody in the 18, but Peter Vermees made zero <laughs> substitutions. So there you go. Philly, LAFC's starting lineup. Yeah, you mentioned Memo Rodriguez. Uh, obviously, we brought they brought him in. One of their key signings. When Memo Rodriguez is one of your key signings, you have to wonder what is going on. But Memo Rodriguez, a veteran of this league with nearly 150 games played. And by you going through that starting lineup, Scarf, in my head, the only thing I'm thinking is Polito over 30, Johnny Russell over 30, Fontas over 30. Uh, that's the couple of most, three of the most important players on your team, well over 30, and Tim Melia over 30 as well. But as we know, in goalkeeper years, that doesn't necessarily mean a damn thing. Uh, as far as LAFC is concerned, somebody who definitely is over 30 in between the pipes, Hugo Lloris, our back line, Ryan Hollingshead, Jesus David Murillo, Aaron Long, Omar Campos. Uh, we're going to start calling him yellow card Omar pretty soon here. Midfield, Timothy Tillman, Ilya Sanchez, the former member of Sporting Kansas City, and Edward, yellow card himself, Atuesta. Up top, Kike Oliveira, Matush Bogush, and uh, Denny Bowanga. And unlike Peter Vermees, Steve Chirondolo did utilize a sub, and that would be the unbelievably fast David Martinez. Yeah, I'm telling you, he was my pick to click. Uh, didn't play until the 78th minute, which we'll get to. Almost Philly, made a profit out of you. Philly, your pick to click. Can we talk about the first 20 minutes and the Eric Tommy show that happened for Sporting Kansas City? 20 minutes in, it was Eric Tommy versus the world. I mean, he absolutely ran away from the midfield uh, going straight at goal to get a corner in the second minute. In the eighth minute, it was Eric Tommy to Johnny Russell, which was deflected out in front. In the 11th minute, it was Eric Tommy from distance. In the 16th minute, it was Eric Tommy from distance. I mean, yeesh. Eric Tommy was everywhere for Sporting Kansas City. But that being said, we're looking at two great saves by Tim Melia from the outset. Fourth minute, Timothy Tillman, who... There were large stretches of this matches of this match where you forgot Timothy Tillman was on the pitch. And then there were moments, Philly, like the fourth minute where he comes out of nowhere, gets the steal, picks up a foul to earn the free kick. And Edward Atuesta, who's been incredible on the free kick, a perfectly executed free kick, Philly, in that fourth minute. Ryan Hollingshead just two goals away from 30, tying Graham Zusi in all competitions by a defender and just not getting enough on it. It was more for accuracy than it was for power and a big save by Tim Melia. Could you imagine the uh, the ha-ha-ha moment he would have had with Graham Zuzzi if Ryan Hollingshead did get <laughs> enough dome on that ball to smash it past Tim Melia to go one away and scored that against your own team? I know I would be... Uh, laughing all about that. But yes, Tim Melia coming up with one of many of saves that he would have. As you said, a man of the match candidate, I would say uh, the on the other side for LAFC, our goalkeeper had a man of the match kind of performance as well. Uh, what does today and LAFC ha and yesterday's game have in common? Savings, daylight savings and goalkeeper savings. A lot of savings going on. But as you said, Eric Tommy was all over the place. 29-year-old from Germany. The kid can flat out ball. I mean, spent some time in Stuttgart, spent some time uh, at Kaiserslautern, uh, spent some time uh, at, at Augsburg. So he's been around the block for a couple of teams that have kind of yo-yoed around the Zweite Bundesliga and the Bundesliga. Um, and I think he spent some time at Regensburg too, which is 
having, I think they were having a really good Pokal season. I, I'm forgetting about that. But Eric Tommy, fantastic. Now, the chemistry between him and Johnny Russell was absolutely there. Those two would feed off of each other. Johnny Russell, who I will refer to as either Johnny Soccer or got Johnny Scotch from, the, uh, from here on out. Those guys were absolutely terrifying to LAFC's back line. They were everywhere, aggressive, making their attempts. They both looked good together, and it makes sense because they've been playing with each other for a couple of years now since Eric Tommy made his debut in 2022 against LAFC. Yeah, just uh, a quick fact check for you, sir, since you talked about what it would be like to score against Graham Zussi's old team. In 2020, Ryan Hollingshead did it twice for the for FC Dallas scored against Sporting Kansas City. So two of his 28 goals have come against Sporting in the 12th minute. I mean, Tim Melia again. Timothy Tillman to Matty Bogush to Edward Atuesta and Atuesta on the doorstep. And it was like a one-handed last-minute reach-up Great save by Tim Melia. Uh, and look, we got to talk just a little bit now because it's the second game in a row, but the first one that wasn't played in a blizzard where, yeah, it's so funny that you're bringing this up. Noel 9037, while we are, I'm just about to talk about it, double teaming. They are clearly going after Omar Campos's side instead of Ryan Hollingshead and Jesus Murillo. They're going after uh, Omar Campos and Aaron Long. And in the 20th minute, Omar was caught just a little bit upfield after a fantastic big switch by Tim Leibold. I mean, this big switch was right on the money, finding Johnny Russell, who drew inside. And look, Johnny Russell is like Carlos Vela. He's going to his left foot every single time. And the fact that Omar Campos got drawn inside the way that he did, he went for goal from just outside uh, the right side of the box, just over the bar. But it could have been very, very dangerous johnny russell is as good of a goal scorer as there is i believe he hit the post in the in the second half as well and, and again it's a little unnerving now watching omar campos every now and then getting caught out of position but that being said a very even first 20 minutes of the match philly no, I agree. And we, we got lucky that they were only knocking on our door and dinging into our post. But you're right. Attacking Omar Campos was part of Peter Vermees's, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Offensive mindset. I He took a look at the tape via the RSL game, and there wasn't much you can gather from that from a tactical perspective. But, yes, it's interesting. We bring in a player that we <clears throat> assume is going to easily take over for Chiqui Palacios, and then – Teams are attacking that side of the field. You know what to expect going through Ryan Hollingshead on one side, but Omar Campos is going to get it. I assume that he is. I mean, he's a good playmaker. He's good with the ball. Uh, yes, some of his sequences defensively have been a little suspect. But you talked about him in the 27th minute. Had a pass over to Bogush, who, who took a shot. Not enough, and I'm going to mess this up because it's it's referred to as a Polish spice. Uh, Peter Sprawi? Here's Prowie. He didn't have enough. Here's Prowie on his attempt. So that was an easy pickup. Um, yeah, an easy, I, I'm screwing that word up, man. <laughs> oh, I'm look, if there's one thing I, I know about the Polish language, and and luckily I've spent a lot of time. I, 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 there's there's no chance you're pronouncing that right because some there's just no chance. I don't know the right way to pronounce it, but man, it is it is difficult. Look, 28th minute, Alan Pulido is there <clears throat> after uh Holling said pass. To, to Jesus Murillo. Ugh, yucky Ryan, turnover. Ryan, I love you, buddy. But look, we talk about this kind of the same thing in the NBA. You don't inbound the ball underneath your own basket across the court like that. That's exactly what Ryan Hollingshead did in a pass back to Jesus Murillo. And if not, again, for Hugo Lloris making possibly his biggest save of the match there in the 28th minute, uh, we are we are down one nothing. Uh, by the way, great tactical yellow foul, yellow card foul by Memo Rodriguez earlier to stop what might have been our best break in the first half. Yep. But a really dumb foul by Omar Campos in the 31st yeah. minute uh, to pick up that yellow card. Guy has to now play 60 minutes on a yellow for delaying play on a restart. <laughs> All they were trying to do was throw the ball in. Just get the heck away from the ball. And, and to be perfectly honest, Philly, through the rest of the half, there were a couple of times where there was some good passing, uh, but nothing ever really leading to an opportunity for the rest of the half. Just one minute of stoppage time. But eh, it was a look, 
that everybody was saying on, on social media, we were texting people that were at the game because we were, you know, we had a little bit of FOMO. We were missing an LAFC match. And everyone's saying, oh, you know, the game not played very well. It's been not been a good game, this and that. The first half wasn't awful. It wasn't very good by either side. Both goalkeepers playing very well. I thought Melia had the upper hand. Hugo did whatever he needed to do. And we get into the half, nil-nil. Yeah, well, don't for, also make up the bring up the fact that within that 34th minute, my guy Tommy had a brilliantly placed ball to Polito, who got denied, and then Das Fus ball gets over to Johnny Scotch, who just ever so wide to the right of Hugo Lloris. That was another scary moment. Johnny Russell bit getting very close to scoring. You think momentum would carry over into the second half, but you talk about the first half. Yes, it was fine. It was sporting Kansas city that had the vast majority of attempts and shots on target, 10 shots, four of them on target. LAFC had possession 41% of the game sporting Kansas city, the lion's share, the XG factor for LAFC was a lot higher at, Spot 9-2, spot 4-2 for Sporting Kansas City. And uh, here's a spoiler for you. Those numbers are going to go down even more within the second half. But LAFC did have some big chances. Tim Melia came up very, very well. And I remember you telling me at some point while we were calling the UC Riverside game at halftime that you saw passing accuracy for SKC at the half at 94%. I don't know if that was a mistype or whatever, but the statistics I read off of the 269 accurate passes, they had 88% of it. But either way, they were passing the ball really well. And my key to the game was to control the midfield. And just judging by the statistics that I've gone through, it was Sporting Kansas City that was controlling the midfield, not LAFC. Yeah, look, I'll say that they did a little bit more with their midfield, but our midfield showed up in moments. I, I, I thought that, again, nil-nil at the half and, and not very many big chances from either side. So uh, not too much to dissect there. But into the second half, Andreu Fontas picking up an early yellow after fouling Timothy Toman in the middle of the park. So now you have a couple of guys on yellow. You can maybe start to attack that back line a little bit, but nope. Here's that post that I was talking about. Alan Pulido to Johnny Russell. Pulido with a beautiful kind of diving stab at the ball to get it to Johnny Russell, who again pulls Omar Campos inside and hit that post from distance. And, and I loved, I, I don't remember which uh, of the two commentators said it, but right after that ball pings, off the post, he said, LAFC needs to wake up right now. And wake up they did. I think after that, to be perfectly honest, not a lot from Sporting Kansas City over the next, I would say, maybe 15 minutes or so up until the 70th minute. I thought Kike Oliveira looked good in transition in the 54th minute. Uh, but Tim Melia, again, doing Tim Melia things, came out, cut off the angle, uh, another yellow for sporting in the 60th to Danny Rosero. And then Philly, the frustration mounting for Denny Bawanga in the 67th minute. Denny knock, knock, knocking on Melia's door uh, after a foul by Tim Melia gave LAFC. I mean, did you see where this free kick was? It was like an inch and a half outside the box. It's something off the training ground. It was great. It was it was Matty Bogush and Timothy Tillman kind of working on something there. And Tillman like pushes it just to the right of where they were set up. And Denny misses, I mean, just wide of that far post. And Philly, you were hoping that that would be the first for number 99. And as I assume he was hoping the first for him as well. Yeah, he was he was off the mark on that. We, we, we harp on Kike Oliveira quite a bit in terms of his ability to finish. I do want to mention that in that 54th minute, because of Danny Buanga's uh, running the point, so to speak, connecting with Kike Oliveira, if you ever have doubted how fast this kid is, that was a healthy reminder as to the Jets that he has. There's going to be another LAFC player that we're going to talk about momentarily that's even faster than him, but yes, frustrating that neither of those attempts within the 54th or the 67th minute were on target. Uh, Tim Elia was doing his thing, but in those positions and in those time frames, we didn't do anything to assault him. We had some really good chances, and we were just completely off the target, off the mark there. Yeah, look, our chat wants to talk a little bit about how Denny Bawanga and David Martinez uh, got along with each other. Well, let's get David Martinez into the match. For just a second, in the 70th minute, you got Daniel Shalloway with a couple of opportunities, but nothing really there. The Hungarian for my hitman, Hoover's went over Hugo. There's my alliteration for the day. 
That was a lot of ages all in a row there. Gary, that was Rivers over Hugo. Yeah, no, we heard it the first time. That was pretty good. Yeah, I just, uh, I just but Daniel Shall we again my pick to click, and I was really hoping. I mean, I wasn't hoping he would do anything, but hey, look, one of my one of my picks did something. Well, the second of mine, I just as I'm taking notes, I said, you know what? Maybe it's time for a change. 70th minute, not a lot going on. <clears throat> I got to wake up. LAFC a little bit, and they certainly do by subbing off Ilya Sanchez and making his home debut. David Martinez, so excited to watch this kid play. And in a little bit of a, not a formation change, but some positional changes for some of the players out there as David Martinez comes on to one wing, it's Kike Oliveira on the opposite wing, and that moves Denis Bawanga to the nine while Matty Bogush moves back to his traditional midfield position. And I really thought, okay, David Martinez is going to get things working here. A couple of corners for sporting in the 80th minute. And then in the 81st, Ryan Hollingshead coming out of nowhere to play the nine. It looked like for at least this offensive possession, they were playing with four in the front as Hollingshead chest down a ball right in the middle of the park. Uh, kind of had it deflected over to Denis Bawanga. I don't know if it was a shot or a pass or what happened. But Denise shot from close, saved again by Tim Melia in the 81st minute. Tim Melia doing Tim Melia things. Yeah, Tim Melia is a, a solid goalkeeper, man. And I think it was our friend from the 110 football days, Mariana Trujillo, who made the comment about Hollingshead being in that number nine. And we were listening to it. I think we had just gotten right by the mission in at that yep. point in Riverside. And when I heard Ryan Hollingshead as the number nine, my jaw dropped. <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, are we really in this scenario? Ryan Hollingshead doing that? But look, the guy is, is he's played up top before he did that while he was in college. He did that while he was at UCLA. When he comes into major league soccer, spending time with, uh, with FC Dallas, that's when he transitioned more into a defensive role, but it shouldn't come as a surprise to either of us for that matter, that Ryan Hollingshead was in that, uh, in that position. Uh, 83rd minute memo Rodriguez with a great shot that gets denied due to an even greater save by Hugo Lloris. And then that 84th minute LAFC had a counter and wow, David Martinez with some blazing speed. You don't even have to know a damn thing about the sport to realize that this kid is so stinking fast. He absolutely executes Jacob Davis in the box. Not even funny. Uh, nearly annihilated him, but shot was off the mark. He had Denny open to the right. Missed him. I don't blame him for having the, uh, the guts to go for it, especially at his young age. But ah, uh, I understand the hype. All I needed was him to score to make me a believer. Yes, you wait, what? No, ah, he looked twice over at Denny Bawanga. He looked, I watched it on slow motion. He goes, Oh, Denny's over there. Cool. And then he makes that move, by the way. Oh my god, that move. Like, he that was that's not even I, like a juke, that's like a straight up and one annihilation. Absolutely. And then after he makes the move, you know what he does? He looks over at Denny Bawanga again, the golden boot winner from last year, the leader of your team, the unquestioned best goal scorer in Major League Soccer. And all he has to do, all he has to do is, boop, little pass over to Denny. Not only does it get Denny Bawanga going, but it shows David Martinez is able to make the right play. And instead, what does he do to Ben's old drumming spot up in the 38th <laughs> row of the 3252? Are you kidding me? He doesn't even put it on frame. He was every bit the young kid who was brought in to play the wing position in that moment. There was visions of Brian Rodriguez dancing oh, in my no, head no, 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 after no, that no, shot. No, no, yes. no. Take that yes. away right now. Do no. not bestow that curse nope. and that jinx on this young man. Horse it's hockey. There is not, no Brian Rodriguez not a curse. on him. Not a curse, but the lack of ability to be in the oh, moment and to oh. understand that you've got Denis Bawanga right there. Are you kidding me? You drop that ball off for Denis Bawanga. We're up one nothing in the 84th minute, and it's all over. But the three points that we get to take home, our first win of this, or excuse me, our second win of the season at home and defending the bank like we need to. I was so frustrated at David Martinez in that moment, only because I saw him look twice. If he was just head down, bull in a china shop, barreling through, looking for that goal, I would have said, okay. But, oh, my goodness, he looked twice. He knew he had him twice. Twice. 
Call the witch doctor. You just bestowed one of the biggest curses you could on a young winger, and that's giving him the Brian Rodriguez hex. You might as well have thrown a little bit of Andre Horta on him while you're at it. You're going to get people to start thinking. While you view that as a negative thing, and yes, it was, should have connected with Denny Bowanga. But this is a kid brought in to also score. And his blazing speed and his ability to get himself through danger, out of traffic, into the box, an open spot, and the fact that he had the balls, the intestinal fortitude, the cojones, the marbles to take that shot, that should be the positive that you take from there. Because while, yes, it could have been the make or break to give us three points, it wasn't. We still managed a point, unfortunately. But he would have another opportunity to capitalize, which he didn't. But don't bestow the, the Rayito curse on him. Listen, all I'm saying is he looked twice at him. He's got to know his role, and he's got to get that pass over to Denis Bawanga. Look, Edward Atuesta picking up a yellow card in the 88th minute. I don't love these late yellows by Edward Atuesta. It wasn't even a tactical foul. It was just one of those where, come on, Edward, just get out of the match without a yellow. We all remember the Edward Atuesta from several seasons prior where he would pick up some of these unnecessary yellows and then maybe have to miss a match. I don't like the aspect or the the possibility of a midfield right now without Edward Atuesta in it. I thought he was really solid defensively for us. I thought he did a lot that we needed him to do there in the midfield, even though I think our midfield did get outplayed at times, like you've mentioned, by sporting Kansas City's. But I just don't love the late yellow. And then Philly, I want to mention this good moment from Omar Campos really pressing high. I mean, Steve Trundolo was throwing all the bodies forward. You could hear Peter Vermees yelling to get forward on the other side. So they really opened things up after David Martinez came into the match there after about the 80th minute. But Omar Campos with a great steal right out in front of the goal box there and pushes the nice pass forward to Denis Bawanga. But another save by Tim Melia. Bawanga's got to be feeling a little snake bit. And then look, it's a little deceptive with the corners being as even as they were yep. uh, three straight corners for LAFC that really led to nothing defended very well by sporting there. And Philly, we go into three minutes of stoppage time and Oh my goodness, Philly, we had two incredible chances and you mentioned one right at the end there for Denny Bawanga missing another. Yeah. But I just want to talk about how that play got built up. It was another brilliant ball placed by Hugo Lloris. I mean, it's stuff like this that makes me understand why we have him in between the pipes and why we don't have J-Mac and Maxime anymore. I absolutely love those guys, but they were not able to do something as precise as what Hugo Lloris can do. Man, can he pass. But you said it. David Martinez accelerated in. He had too tough of, uh, too tough of a touch, Jesus, in the box, and that leaves it off to Kike Oliveira, who takes a shot. It looked like it ricocheted right off the back of Jacobs, but Melia was there to make a save, and that's all that she wrote. Your best players on the pitch were goalkeepers. If you're a goalkeeper, an aspiring pro goalkeeper, this was the match for you because between Melia and between Lloris, it was a heck of a duel that resulted in a stalemate. Fun from that perspective, but like you said, a 0-0 draw, but not necessarily a boring game. The moments were exciting. The buildups were exciting. There's a lot to be had and a lot to be taken away from this game. And it's at this point, I'd say only a matter of time before David Martinez inserts himself into the starting lineup. There's no way you could keep that kid on the bench for too long. But I will say, my dude, Eric Tommy on Sporting Kansas City, he was a man of the match candidate because I'm gonna he, he created the most chances out of anybody between either side. We're talking about five chances. The kid is good, and he, for some reason, always plays well against LAFC, where he did get screwed up, though. I think he lost around seven or so duels. But Eric Tommy was the best field player, in my opinion, along with Johnny Russell on Sporting Kansas City. Uh, who would be your pick for LAFC? <sighs> Look, it's tough, right? But I I'm going to go as frustrating uh, of moments as he had in the match. I'm still going to go with Denny Bowanga. Five shots to lead the team. I didn't love his effort in the second minute at of stoppage after that free kick where he could have found Murillo on the back post. But you know what? You paid Denny Bowanga to score goals. Murillo was a little pissed there. I, I, what, <laughs> I don't, little, you what I didn't like over the course of the match is all the frustration that's being shown by LAFC, 
whether it's towards the referees or whether it's to each other, look, we have a lot of emotionality out there on the pitch at all times. With Edward Atuesta, who we know is a fiery, emotional guy. With Jesus Murillo, who we know is a fiery, emotional guy. With a, a young kid like Kike Oliveira, with an, a, an established star who's starting to get a little frustrated three matches in, like Denny Bowanga. I think what LAFC needs to figure out a way to do at times, even Ilya Sanchez getting a little upset, frustrated at the referees from time to time. And look, again, maybe these clubs are starting to get a little frustrated with the lack of refereeing ability that we're seeing from some of these guys. Although I don't think the referee was particularly to blame at all for this. I mean, referee was fine. I, I don't know. Nothing really I saw over the course of the match. But the emotionality that we're continuing to show, I, I just hope that when things really begin to go well for LAFC, that we're showing the same amount of emotionality, but in positive ways towards each other, because you can tell frustration building up a little bit now. Obviously, we played a great match against Seattle Sounders to win 3-2 on opening night, but then an obviously frustrating scene in Sandy, Utah, and then to go 90 minutes at home to have as many good chances as they did but sometimes keepers win you matches and take you home points as well. And that's exactly what we saw from Tim Melia. Hugo Lloris made all the saves that Hugo Lloris needed to make, uh, but I didn't think that any of them were really match-changing saves as much hmm. as maybe Tim Melia's were. But look, you ask him to do his job, and Hugo did his job. I just uh, I, I worry, I worry quite a bit about the emotionality and the frustration that seems to be building on the pitch. Yeah, I mean, speaking of Hugo, six saves, first clean sheet. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's look, we're one, one, and one. Not awful, not gangbusters, but did you expect us to come out of the gates red hot? I can't say that I did. I think we've got a really good starting lineup, but the one substitution also goes to show me that Steve doesn't have that much confidence in the bench. It just goes to show you that maybe we're we're, we're certainly not as deep as we think we are to only sub in one player in such a heated game against a, a conference rival speaks volumes to me. This was only the fourth time that we've ever had a zero zero draw uh, at home, which is wild. I, I guess these things are going to start piling on. Maybe you could toss this one in your this day in LAFC history, <laughs> but June 7th, 2023 was the last time we were all treated to a zero zero nada fest against Atlanta United. Put this one in your record books for Sporting Kansas City. And yeah, one substitution. Just crazy, crazy. One substitution between both sides. Crazy. Let's talk about our bench for just a quick second, Philly, because I think you bring up a good point. Uh, we weren't going to sub in a backline guy, right? Backline was playing just fine. So, so that means Eddie Segura, not a factor on the bench. Sergi Palencia, not a factor on the bench. Well, guess what? Those are our two most senior players uh, on, on pretty much on our roster uh, off the bench, other than a guy like Eric Duenas, who's been here, I mean, since like, what, 2015, 2016? But you have Eric Duenas, Nathan Ordaz, Tommy Musto. Uh, no Tomas on, Robbie. Yeah, Tomas on hell and David Martinez. Are any of those guys older than 20, 21, 22 years old? I mean, I think Tomas on hell is the oldest out there, and, and Tomas on hell is 21. We've got such a young inexperienced bench and again i'll say it and i know he's not the answer but i'm just throwing something out there to have a veteran on your bench be able to come off i don't know maybe it's not adama diamande maybe it's a guy like uh who can i get how about carlos vela how about carlos vela with the ability to come off your bench in the 60th minute and, and do some things for lafc like i don't know he's done his entire major league soccer career, uh, we got to figure out a way to get, if it's not going to be Carlos Vela, guys, how many players are sitting out there in March that could make an impact in this system and, and as quickly as we apparently need it? All I'm saying is, if you look at the back of the lineup card, and someone brought it up in the chat, all these teams have these long lineups that are listed on the back of their lineup card, and, and LAFC's got three quarters of the names back there that everybody else does. I'm not saying you just bring in names to fill up the lineup card, but could it really hurt to bring in 
a guy like Adama Diamande or someone similar. I mean, there's three guys in the pool, but only one of them is a striker. So I didn't even know there was a pool. But that being said, Philly, we need a little depth. It could hurt bringing in a guy like Adama Diamande who would take a spot and get hurt. You're right. I mean, we don't have a, a complete roster, but this is, you know, a, a, a work in progress. Signing Denny Buwanga is a big reason as to why we've been stalling in this process. Uh, obviously, with the boys going in and making MLS Cup final, bonuses were awarded. That messes around with salary cap space. That prevents clubs from doing the proper things they need to do, which is establish their team. This league doesn't want dynasties to be created. Uh, it just it wants to rip apart and punish teams that win MLS Cup. Uh, it, that Look, we don't even have to have been in this league as supporters watching it for that long to know that simply from winning MLS Cup in 2022. We got punished. We couldn't hang on to one of our best goal scorer. Uh, fortunately, we had another great goal scorer in the mix. Imagine if we would have had both of them. And if the league would have allowed us to pay these players what they're worth, we would have not been having these conversations, nor would we be one, one, and one at this moment in time. But such is life. We move on to to, to go battle another day. And you look like you got the runs. What's I, up? No, 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 no. I'm good. I just want to bring up one other small thing. Uh, we're talking about guys like Diego Luna at Real Salt Lake who came from – uh, MLS next and is really making an impact. There are a bunch of guys who who you look at across the league and were playing an MLS next pro or USL or something who have come in and made a real impact. I just want to remind everybody that in 31 matches last season with Tampa Bay Rowdies, Cal Jennings had 19 goals and three assists. And in 37 matches uh, with Phoenix rising, including the playoffs last season, Danny Trejo, had 19 goals and nine assists. These were guys that were depth pieces on our roster that obviously wanted to go somewhere else to play, right? And play they have and play well they have. 19 goals apiece for these two players in USL last year. Just something to think about that maybe it would be good to keep some of these strikers on. I know they want to go and they want to play somewhere else, but those two guys, Look, would it be the worst thing in the world bringing a Cal Jennings or a Danny Trejo off the bench now at this point? Maybe we look to some of these USL clubs and see if we can take a top goal scorer or two. It's just, just uh, I don't know, some food for thought. It's it's a good food for thought. And yes, I would agree on Danny Trejo and Cal Jennings, but there's a big difference between them and Diego Luna. And that's uh, five and six years, respectively. Cal Jennings at 26, uh, Danny Trejo at 25. Is that a problem? Maybe. But when you find that in Diego Luna, who's 20, there you go. That's an advantage. So I do agree with you. That's a good point. But you're holding on to former LAFC players. I've kind of gathered that throughout this past. Adama Diamandi, you bring up Cal Just Jennings. Just looking. Danny Just Trejo. looking. I get it. And, yes, there are good players outside, young players that could do their thing. But, you know, there's – there's a reason why they're no longer on the team anymore. And as much as you say you trust the process and trust John Thorrington, I would say think about as to why those players aren't here anymore. Look, I, I worry about our depth. I worry about playing a 34-game season, having to apparently play some of those games in a blizzard. Uh, I worry yeah, about a lot uh, with uh, U.S. Open Cup uh, coming up in May. I worry about League's Cup coming up in July and August. I worry about the potential run through the playoffs that we're hoping to make. Uh, look, we played 53, 54 matches last season, and we saw the toll that it took. And we're, we don't have 50 matches scheduled on our season this year, but we could have 40, 42, 44, who knows, depending on how far we go in the two cups that we'll be playing for midseason and, of course, MLS Cup. And so what I don't want to do is run the tires off of these guys early. That being said, don't forget our first 12 matches of the season, folks. 12 matches are seven days apart. Seven days apart each. We don't have a Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday. We do have time to rest. We do have time to work on things at the training ground. We do have time to get guys healthy. And we do have time to acclimate depth pieces over the course of a week if we bring them in. I agree. I agree. And uh, I like that we're not getting bombarded with games right off the bat and, and immediately because 
I don't know about you, but towards the end of last season, I was kind of ready to take a break from going to BMO. I've said that many a times. This right here, just making you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, so to speak. Um, and that being said, the absence is a lot greater for Scarf and I, considering the fact that we weren't at the stadium yesterday. And that's not going to happen very often. It's two straight tailgates where you don't see the defenders of the bank tent. I can assure you that won't be the case. So, couple final quick words on on, on, the, on the game and just a couple of things from a macro perspective. Next time you see Edward Atuesta on the pitch, that will be his 100th regular season appearance for LAFC, putting him up there with Carlos Vela, Latif Blessing, Diego Rossi, Jose Cifuentes, and Chiqui Palacios. Sometimes I scratch my head thinking we had Sifu for as long as we have. And for those of you who are saying, oh, Danny's not doing his thing, he's not trying hard enough, look, he ranks third in the league with the amount of shots that he's taken, 17. Um, so that's got to count for something at the very least, right? The vast majority of them, of course, were, well, at BMO, but, you know, they're just a couple of stats, a couple of things to think about. He'll turn it on, and when he does, you know it's not just one goal. It's usually a break. It, it could be a brace or a hat trick, which will easily put him back into that conversation for the golden boot race. So, look, we're one, one, and one. Nothing too crazy. Uh, nothing too convincing, but you know, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Denny's signing frees up time and money and resources. I think we'll get there. Yeah. Look, uh, our next match Saturday, March 16th at Allianz in Minnesota, away to Minnesota United, 5 30 PM next Saturday, March 16th. Uh, look, I know it's early, but pending how the matches go for today, LAFC currently sitting in eighth place on four points, but Look, three matches into a 34-match regular season. Philly, we managed to keep it under an hour on a nil-nil draw. Well done, my friend. Uh, uh, Hugo Reese, Tim Melia, stars of the show. Philly, uh, anything you'd like to say to end it, or are we just going to do our, our regular bye-bye? I just wanted uh, – you You brought up the fact that we're playing the loons. I had to make sure that there wasn't going to be a snow warning. When they engage in battle, it'll be around 46 degrees uh, and no chances of rain, so – that means no snow. That's all I have to say. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, don't forget. I'll do uh, nope. a lot next time, Ruben. No. Don't forget, like, like, subscribe, and follow to all of us here at Defenders of the Bank on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever you got. And you know how we like to end each and every one of our episodes, including this one, episode 291 of Defenders of the Bank. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> ah. where's, where's the button? There.